Okay, hi, I'm Dr. Nolan, and I will be presenting an overview for phase two and phase three of our project, be discussing key findings, and then I'll be sharing some exciting news about ongoing research initiatives at the Grief Recovery Institute, and then we will be welcoming any questions that you might have towards the end of the presentation. So briefly revisiting the research aims for phase two and three of our project, our intent was to use that instrument, the GRMI, to assess the impact exposure to the program had on those theoretical variables, COP, and to evaluate the theoretical and programmatic effectiveness of the program. It's important to note, however, that only part of phase three has been conducted as we have not yet been successful in securing funding for the remainder of the project. So we hope that with future funding opportunities and initiatives, we'll be able to complete the entirety of phase three, hopefully, Fingers crossed by spring of next year. So using the instrument, again, the GRMI, we assess the impact or change in scores exposure had of the excuse me, exposure to the program had on Cobb by conducting a repeated measures design with non-randomized participants who served as their own controls. So if you think about experiments, there's always a control group and a treatment group. In this case, the individual served as their own controls. Characteristics of the sample used to assess the impact are presented before you in the slide. There were no significant differences found between participants similar as in the first phase of the study. The sample size consisted of about 171 individuals who predominantly identified as white middle-aged women, again similar to the previous study, from the U.S who participated in the program for a loss that occurred about 12 years ago. Here, again, are the mean and possible range of scores for the knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, behaviors across observations one to three. So because this was a repeated measures design, we took three specific measurements or observations. No statistically significant differences were found between men and women, except on behaviors of grief, with men scoring slightly higher when compared to women. Previously, as we've shown in phase one, age and years since loss were identified as potential confounders of the data. However, because no difference was found between men and women on these variables, we did not control for them in the repeated measures design. Here's the results of the repeated measures in NOVA that we use to compare the COB scores across those three measurements again. So to explain a little bit, there's a measurement that people received or completed when they signed up for the grief recovery program. Then there was a period anywhere from a couple weeks to several months until they took the second measurement right before they participated in the program and in the last measurement was at the end of the program. This slide also presents the test, retest reliability of the measurement from observation one to two, which was accessible, acceptable. Statistically significant changes in scores were observed on knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors of grief recovery from observations one to two and observations two to three. No significant change in scores was found on beliefs from observation one to two, but a significant increase in scores was found from observation two to three. So many of you probably in the audience are like, what the heck does this information mean? Well, what it means is based on the results and the effect of the program on the targeted variables, which was between 0 0.53 and 0 0.91, we now have evidence to confirm that the program theory held and that it had the intended influence on the variables of the program. So I think that's where the <laughs> applause. Yeah. And similarly to phase one, respondents scored high with regards to the maximum possible scores on knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, behaviors for observation three which indicates that participation in the grief recovery program can be an effective tool to promote grief 
recovery, thereby potentially reducing grief among those millions of grievers. Exciting news, right? <laughs> so now that we have this evidence to show that the theory of grief recovery works to influence the variables targeted by the program, we need to conduct the remaining part of phase three. So to date, this research has been exclusively funded by Kent State University as a courtesy to the grief recovery method on behalf of myself, Dr. Hallam, and the Dean of the College of Public Health. This means that we are now in a stage in the project where additional funding is required to conduct that final evaluative piece or that final part of phase three. So we are exploring at this moment, I just had a candid conversation last night, um, some creative ways to fund the remainder of this project, whether it's through organizational funding or foundational sponsorship, private donors, grants, those types of things. It's a hefty price tag, a really good evaluation study between seventy-five dollars and $100,000. I don't have that in my pocket right now. So now that we have shared these results of our exciting research news, um, I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit and discuss the ongoing research initiatives at the Grief Recovery Institute. These include a new research landing page, which will be available in October 2018, 